Go, NTD on 212. Com check. DPS. Go. Inco. Go. PUS. Go. Surgeon. Go. Booster. Go. Copy that. We have a go from you guys. This is Talking Sound. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Talking Sound Podcast, the only podcast on the internet where negative 10 is a number to be desired. I am Chris Jordan, your host, and with me right now is Chris Reddish. Uh, I met Chris many years ago. Uh, I guess we've been working together probably a good five to seven years now on numerous shows in the Houston area. Uh, he is a translator by day and uh, does translation for corporate events, stuff like that, but is also a comedian, improv comedian, writer, director, um, all kinds of stuff. And we're going to talk about the whole panoply that is his life and uh, kind of what led him into this industry on both sides, um, both as technician and performer. So uh, welcome to the show, Chris. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. And um, <laughs> I'm going to have to I'm going to have to go and Google Panoply, um, uh, find out what find out what it is that I'm uh, supposed to be uh, talking it, it about. Yeah, it almost means oh. a plethora. Oh. <laughs> it's it's just oh, okay. a wide, a a plethora, wide array. A plethora I am familiar with. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's, it's, well, thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for having me. I really appreciate you, it. You are a menagerie you. of a man uh, and, and a dodecahedron <laughs> of a person, you know, just I'm going to see how verbose I can get here. Um, there are yeah, many facets well. to Chris Reddish. And that's what's interesting is that, like I said, when I first met you, it was on a corporate gig that I've worked for nine right. years now in, in Houston. Right. I want to say we've both worked it for the same amount of time. And uh you, you're, ti- yeah. you're typically there with the translation booths. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're a Russian translator. Am I correct? Uh, no, you are incorrect. Um, oh, wow. I, okay. I am a translation technician when I'm uh, on those jobs. So, uh, oh, okay, I'm not okay. I thought the translation. You were... I'm just uh, making sure that uh, everybody can hear the translators. Um, got you, got you. So, so you're me. I thought you were actually like one of the people in the booth here and there. So no, no, I mean, no, I, I, uh, I only go in the booth to, to, um, sound test or take a nap. Okay. Well, I've definitely taken a nap in the booths before. Um, (laughs) they're very well, well insulated, (laughs) (laughs) but what led you into, um, audio engineering to begin with? What, what kind of, let's start there. Um, since that is career path, and then we'll follow that up with uh, passion path and what got you into comedy. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. So, yeah. So the basically, and I'm not. I'm not really an audio technician. Uh, I don't have that training or qualifications that that you and your colleagues have. I basically <laughs> am a translation uh, uh, translation audio person. So I understand and know enough to operate translation equipment, but I couldn't do what you guys do. So basically what happened was that um, uh, 25 years or so ago, uh, a group that I was involved with, a um, nonprofit group, had some really old translation equipment and uh, they didn't want it anymore. And I arranged to buy it from them. Uh, and it was horrible. It was an AM inductive loop system Love it. that uh, required, uh, required an antenna to be taped to the floor and had a range of about 10 feet. So you had to zigzag this cable um, that you taped to the floor, you know, every 10, mm-hmm. 20 feet um, in between the chairs. Uh, it was just a horrible, horrible system. Um, but for a couple of years, we used that and we managed to save up enough money to buy uh, a small FM system. And then we built up, built up from there. So, yes, yeah. came about. And oh. and that that's one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. And what, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is because it it is uh, a lot of this show is um, different paths within the industry, things that people don't understand. Like, oh, you know, like I started off in rock and roll and theater, um, really in theater, and then moved into rock and roll after college, stuff like that. And, buddy, the day I found the world of corporate AV, I ran with arms wide open. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, When I moved to Austin, people were like, oh, what's the rock scene like? I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't touch it. 
I, I do nothing but corporate AV now. Um, right. <laughs> and it's not for everybody. It's a different world um, than, right. than rock and roll. It's a different world than theater. And it's, it's interesting how um, even though the job is basically the same amongst the industries, the, the industry itself is so different. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, what was it like for you, um, as an entrepreneur, as somebody starting out, striking out with their own business and doing that kind of stuff? Um, explain some of that to our audience. Cause like, I, I definitely appreciate that owning my own business, owning my own podcast network, things like that. But, right. um, not everybody understands some of the intricacies involved. And, uh, the one thing that I, right. that I love that you mentioned, because everybody always asks me how I ended up up with all this gear Mm. it was like well i had a day job for a long time and i did gigs Mm -hmm. at night and all the money the like daytime paid my bills gigs at night bought my gear um and then Mm -hmm. it just once i became self-employed and doing my stuff it became the fact that i tried to make a like earmark a certain amount of money from every gig to put toward more gear you know, and mm-hmm. the fact that you started, like you said, with an inductive loop AM system, something that nowadays you would absolutely mm-hmm. have to have a uh, FCC regulated license or permit to use. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like yeah. there's like they would come find you rapidly. Um, <laughs> they would mm-hmm. triangulate your position so fast uh, and come and say, why, why are you doing this? Please show us your permit to own this. Um, but mm-hmm. to go from one to the other, what was it like for you um, to entrepreneurially take that on? Mm-hmm. It was. I'm, it was tough, basically. Um, I mean, so before, so I moved to this country in 1992. My wife won a green card in the lottery. Wow. Um, that's the lottery that President Trump has made a big deal of trying to abolish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am one of the people that benefited from that. So anyway, yep. so in 1992, we came to this country, and um, after trying to <laughs> – Trying to work in McDonald's for a couple of weeks and then trying to drive airport buses for a few weeks, uh, I ended up learning how to clean people's houses. And so for four years, I had a business cleaning people's houses and I and I hated every minute of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've, but after about three years, uh, I put an ad, uh, I was starting to, I wanted to use this translation equipment. I put an ad in the yellow pages um, and I carried a pager and at the end of a cleaning job, uh, I would return people's calls and take on translation jobs. And after about a year of that, I was able to stay at home and manage both businesses from home. And after another year of that, I was able to sell off the cleaning business and concentrate full time on the translation business. So it was like a two or three year changeover period. Um, but it, you know, it was tough. It was, I mean, it was, it was, it was tough having to do a job that I hated, um, whilst trying to set up a new business that I would like. Um, and even once we got into, you know, once it was full-time translation, it was hard work. I most of the jobs, my but all the jobs, plus I was trying to manage the business as well. Plus the system that we used was all horrible. Um, and and I built a website and I, I built it myself using a dial up internet connection. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it, it, life was hard at times, um, you know, but it paid off. I mean, it was, you know, it was a it was a lot of a lot of hard work. But um, what it, it reached uh, after a few years of really intense work, it reached a point where it, it, it kind of reached cruising altitude and began to be that, so that I could start to hire people to do um, a lot of the work so that I didn't have to do it all myself. And, yeah. um, you know, I could back off a little bit and, you know, go from, um, you know, the uh, overworking, um, you know, night, day and weekends um, to, you know, cutting back to just daytimes and, yeah, so it, it it paid off, but it took a while. Well, and and that's just it. Um, you really, whenever 
it it's something that I've tried to instill um, in the episodes of this show um, and tried to show with my guests is the fact that don't give up, folks. It's it ain't easy being cheesy. Uh, that's that's the only way I can put it. And uh, it takes a lot of work, and more than anything, it takes a lot of wherewithal. Um, because yeah, you know it it takes it takes years. Um, I've been in the Austin market for seven years now, and it's just now gotten to the point where people call me regularly. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it it takes a while whenever you hit a new market, whenever you're doing something new. A to find your stride, B to to find um, your best way of doing that market and and taking care of and servicing your clients. Um, but it also takes some time to grow to that potential um, and get to the point, like you said, where instead of working seven days a week, not taking a vacation, um, you can now work five days a week and focus some of your time on other things in life um, and actually have a life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah>. um, <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. that's what a lot of people don't understand is that, um, yeah, you may not have a life, folks, um, for a little while. Uh, like when I remember when I started dating my, my wife, um, it took a, it, it, it took a while, um, for that barrier of trust to build because I, I had a business and it, a lot of people were like, you know, it's taking y'all a long time to move this thing along and get to marriage. I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand. I'm not just like dating someone like I'm bringing some I'm I'm bringing somebody into the crazy world that is my self-employed life of owning a business. Um and they have to understand the ups and downs of that. They have to understand the dynamic of that and you know, I have to be able to trust somebody with my business. <laughs> You know, right. um, in in order to grow that relationship, and it, there are so many hurdles that it can seem impossible at times. But uh, what what were some of the issues that you faced, other than techno technical issues, that you faced when you first started with your business? Other than the technical issues, um, the Hmm, let's see the i think just the whole marketing process um just uh i mean obviously it's totally different now you know 20 23 years ago it was a very different world of marketing than it is now um but uh that certainly took uh took a lot of effort to to get uh, you know, to get pl- placed in the yellow pages, and <laughs> each ta- each city had a different company that ran their yellow pages. You know, there was no if you wanted to be in in one of the yellow pages, you had to call a different company. There was no, yeah. ah, I mean, it was ridiculous the way the way it was. Um, uh, and uh, and I think always always finding finding the right people. I guess that's that I, that would be the biggest thing: finding the right people, finding people that. Um, that care enough to do a good job that um, that like this kind of work mm-hmm. um, are willing to to be to be flexible um, and you know and that they will do a good job if I treat them well find you know but I think finding the right people has to be yeah. the biggest yeah 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 and I I, I couldn't agree with that more um having put people out there with my name on their shirt. Um, right. You know, it's, it's one of those you really do. It's, it's hard. Cause it, 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 it's like having somebody babysit your kid. Mm-hmm. You know, it is like yeah. <laughs> you're trusting somebody with your livelihood here. You know, like you, right. you could lose an entire client base because somebody had a bad day. Um, if you don't, if you don't choose the right people to work with, um, and with, with that in mind, choosing the right people to work with, um, I want to kind of, I want to kind of seg into how, um, how you came involved with comedy. Um, because that's, that's really one of those things that, um, is a passion for people, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. and, it's it's another one of those things that um, chemically 
you have to be with the right people. Um, mm -hmm. there, there are people who, when they enter a troop, can even though they're great and fantastic, can be toxic to the chemistry of a group, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really delicate. My wife uh, teaches improv comedy and is a comedian herself, stuff like that. But uh, how did you first get involved with comedy? Yeah. So as a kid, I always loved comedy and wanted to do performance, but I was too shy. And so I never auditioned for the school play or did any of that kind of stuff. Um, and then in my mid-20s, I was traveling and I was in Africa with a whole group of people. And I think I was just so so far away from home that I didn't care anymore. And so we decided to put on a comedy show um, out in, <laughs> in Port Sudan. Um, and uh, we got good reviews. You know, people liked it. So... We did another one. And then when I got back from traveling, uh, I did occasional sketch comedy um, for a few years. And then when I'm, that was all when I was living back in England. And then when I moved here, um, I just went along to a, a, an improv show and talked to the director and ended up signing up for the classes and yeah, never looked back. Basically, I uh, spent five years with that troupe, and um, he, the the teacher, was absolutely brilliant. He he really taught me everything I know about comedy. He he was just he was a comic genius. And uh, then he died in um, the year two thousand, and um, so uh, I continued on with the troupe. The troupe continued under a different name for a few years. Uh, I continued with them for a while, um, and then moved into the film side of things a little bit more. Great. And uh, um, speaking of that, you did actually uh, just finally release a film that you've been working on for a while, 1111, uh, comedy sci-fi. You're the writer and director. Uh, it just yes. premiered at the Hollywood Bill, uh, Boulevard Film Fest uh, to yes. great acclaim, uh, winning – Best comedic feature, best director, best actor, and best actress. Like, basically a sweep um, of awards <laughs> for, uh, like, you know, first time at the plate, and here's a grand slam. Um, hey, how's that feel? <laughs> well, uh, well, that felt pretty good, I have to admit. I was I was really nervous because this was our first showing to any audience, and, and I was really nervous about it. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was – so I was I was very pleased that we were get, we got a lot of laughs and they were mostly in the places where I wanted them to be. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so I was very pleased with that. And then uh, yeah, the next evening there was an award ceremony and yeah, it, I mean it really was amazing that um, yeah we we really did get recognized. So that was yeah, that was fantastic. Well, yeah. and tell us a little bit about a the writing process of that um, because I'm I'm someone uh, I give my wife sketch ideas all the time she teaches a lot of sketch and produces a monthly sketch show and i i can't write a lick outside of a like you want me to write a monologue all day long i can write you a good monologue um but i cannot write within the voice of another person um mm. and for her it's literally the fact that she's like uh i think you're looking at it wrong these people are just in my head um you know like they're just they're already talking to me. I'm just writing it down. Uh, mm -hmm. How does how does that process as a writer, as a creator work for you? Um, how do you find the words coming to life? How do you find the characters coming to life? Mm. Yeah, um, I, I do agree with your wife that it's it, it, once you that, I mean, it takes me a while to get to that point. But there is a point where. Yes, the characters have a voice, they have a personality, I see them in my head, I hear them in my head, and uh, and so I, yeah, I, I just imagine them in that situation, what, what are they going to say, what are they going to do? Um, so, yes, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, but there's a there's a whole process for me to get to that point, and um, I, the, the first part of this process um, – and I and I learned this from uh, 
a, a screenwriting teacher, the LA Writers Lab. Uh, I, I love their process. And uh, so this is how I, I learned this process that I now use. It's, it's that they use a, um, it's a very free form um, stream of consciousness, I would call it, writing, where you, uh, you ask yourself a question and then you just write, blurt out whatever comes out. You write it down. Um, and, and, you know, in, in that paragraph or page or whatever it is you've written, there might be one or two little gems that stand out and get transferred forward, or there may be none, you know, or it might be the whole thing gets transferred verbatim into your screenplay later, but, but you don't know that at the time, you you never know what's going to come out. But, but through this process, you, you generate a ton of material and then you sift through that material to see what do i think fits what fits in terms of ideas and plots what 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 seems to fit what i want to work on but mainly in terms of character what fits in terms of character does the is this person um you know what's what's he hiding what's his uh what's his secret what's um what does he want uh what does he fear you know these kind of these sure. kind of thoughts start to come out and coalesce and um yeah and start to become part of the bigger story all right and it, it, now um myself as as it, it just for example a uh, a reader and watcher of comic book movies uh let's say um uh, my my wife um teaches a principle that once the character is written, like you need to stay within the world of that character. You can't really like break his rules, you know, right. Um, kind of like uh, for me, I had an issue with the re-release of super uh, Superman years ago. The one that came out where Superman was mysteriously going to check out Krypton, his planet that had been dead for who knows how long, uh, you know, <laughs> and he left pregnant Lois on earth um, he'd have never left pregnant Lois. Like that is an utter betrayal of the character of Superman. Um, mm-hmm. are you, are you a writer? Are you someone that stays within that paradigm whenever you write someone that, um, they have to obey the rules of the character per se, or are you a bit more fluid with the creation of things? Well, I would, I would suggest that under the right circumstances, anyone will do almost anything. Okay. And so I would argue that if Superman is going to leave pregnant Lois, what is the circumstance that would cause him to do something that is so out of character for him? What, you know, what, what, the, there must be something. Uh, and I, and I don't know what it is um, I'm yeah. not in that world, but, you sure. know, but there is a something. And if they didn't put that something in the movie, then yeah. I think they, they let their audience down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was definitely one of those, like, what? He went to go check out, like, blown up Krypton? He already knows it's blown right. up. What's he going to check out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was one of those, like, uh, okay, I guess I'll let that one slide. Uh, but yeah. um, let's get into a little bit of the movie itself, Eleven Eleven. Um, Give us a little primer uh, of what – some broad strokes of what it's about the plot um, and the creative process of that movie itself. Okay. All right. So it's the story of um, a man who accidentally slept with an alien 16 years ago and never mentioned the fact to his wife. And also uh, a baby came about as a result of that, um, mishap and it's a half human half alien hybrid child that he manages to persuade his wife to grow up uh, to to raise uh, as their own daughter uh, but he doesn't mention to his wife that this uh, the origins of this this uh, daughter that is that it's actually his daughter um he he passes it, he passes her off as uh, a baby found in the woods and uh, they raise this daughter together, and uh, he hasn't told his wife um, anything about uh, how the baby came about, and he also hasn't told the daughter about who she really is. And then the hot alien returns, 
and wants to get to know her daughter and wants to um, spend time with the guy. And of course, that starts to cause some problems. And yeah. so the, the truth starts to come out and um, chaos starts to ensue. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and that it, sounds... As yeah, yeah, as as it tends to do in such situations. Uh, yes. And now, uh, how did that idea come to birth for you? How did that like? Because that's that is an intricate web to be woven mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. begin with, and an yeah. even more intricate web to reveal to an audience. Uh, mm-hmm. What was your process for that? <laughs> Yeah, so I think the I think the idea of that it just came out of the thought of well you know we we or maybe I have white lies you know sometimes there are things that I just really don't want to tell other people and so if I'm going to keep a something secret then what are the implications of that and what happens when when I get found out and you know let's take that on a bigger scale let's let's you know, up this to, you know, to a major, I mean, you couldn't even call it a white lie, a major um, secret. Um, what what are the consequences there? And and I, I, uh, I had decided when I first started working on it, I decided I wanted to write about uh, alien um, or UFO, UFO enthusiasts, um, alien enthusiasts, a group of people that that uh, that are into aliens. That was that was I, I decided I wanted to. That was going to be my focus. And so, and then this is the story that that evolved. And and again, it was through that process of of um, you know uh, stream of consciousness writing that, that these ideas started to develop and come out. Um, and the the whole process of writing. Ended up taking about eighteen months, although the last six months uh, were, were also pre-production. We were, you know, we were ready to make the film um, for the last six months. Although there were still some, still some tweaks going on to the script. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So basically, it was um, yeah about eighteen months of writing. Okay. Yeah, and I mean that's it. From what I know, that's about typical for most people who have written and edited and re-edited um, for mm-hmm. for something like that to come about. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I have a good friend uh, who's been on the show before as well, uh, John Seymour, who does does more horror thriller type things, stuff like that. But even talking to him about um, the creative process once you're on set – and once things start going, um, how it was it was it the fact that once production started flowing, um, that you found the script morphed any? Uh, did did changes come about as readings went on with the actors? You know, as things went on with the camera, um, did did you have any let's say improv moments uh, mm-hmm. that that came about and were birthed that were kept? within the story and the crux of the plot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, all of, all of that really applies. Um, I mean, so part of the, part of the process of pre-production that in fact, I think probably my favorite part of it is uh, a process. And again, I learned this from somebody, a, a guy called Mark Travis, who is a fantastic teacher of acting and directing. And he teaches a process called creative staging, um, which some people would call blocking, you know, deciding where sure, the actor is going to be, where the camera is going to be. But a lot of exactly, yeah, and a lot of people approach that from a very technical point of view. Of okay, we're going to have the best light if the actor stands there, and then we need to have him move over there so that the camera can capture his face in this angle. Yeah, so a lot of people approach it technically, but he pr- approaches it from a purely artistic point of view. Um, his his uh, idea is what what actions will enhance the subtext of the scene uh and and then the camera's job is to find a way of picking that up um okay. so you never cater to the camera the camera's job is to pick that up so so we go we went through a, a long process of uh going through scene by scene with um with actor friends of mine and uh 
w- finding the nuances of subtext in the scene. And so that so the script changed quite a lot through that process. And that went on for uh, six to nine months, something like oh, that. Oh, wow. Um, um, yeah. And that, that's, I mean, obviously not full time, but, uh, you know, but just doing occasional uh, rehearsals. Yeah, for quite a long period. So uh, so then when we got to set, we, we had a pretty clear idea of how each scene was supposed to go. Um, but yes, the, we, were, we were really fortunate with, you know, both of the main actors um, and, and even some of the, the characters that were not the main actors, but they were great improvisers. They, they both have a lot of experience in improv. And so, yes, they were coming up with new stuff uh, all the time on set. And we were able to leave quite a lot of that in. And to me, that a lot of it, what they produced on set is the fun, are the funniest moments. Um, oh, sure. I, I just love some of the, the lines that they came up with and the ideas that they came up with, I think, are, you know, are the funniest parts. So, well, yes, and, a lot of a, a lot of people don't realize that, especially once you get, like we were saying earlier, the right chemistry going on, the right mix of people, um, I, I mean, prime examples of things like that happening. I mean, go go back and watch movies like Caddyshack. Um, watch, watch movies like Ghostbusters, where, where some of those prime beautiful moments that we quote all the time were utterly improv um, in front of the mm-hmm. camera. They were not scripted. I don't even think that they gave Bill Murray a script for Caddyshack, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> they just they just like said, "Yep, he's there," and yeah, they just kind of yeah. let him go, um, right? <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. Um, those kind of experiments for me as a musician. Um, that's a lot of how I make my music is just kind of going in and letting the muse take control and letting the moment happen um, and accepting things as they happen without kind of self editing. A whole lot. Um, do you find yourself uh, a large self-editor whenever you're going through these processes? Um, a self-editor. Uh, well, yeah, I would. I, I guess I would say I am a self-editor because, uh, yeah, I mean, I I make a lot of changes. Um, not hopefully not so much once we get on set but certainly during the writing process i make uh i do make a lot of changes and uh, i yeah i reread the script and make a bunch of notes and then make a bunch of changes um yes and then and i also send it to friends and they make notes and then i make changes um so so yeah i would say uh, i i think that would make me a self-editor i guess and um now you were you were saying before the show that the most it, the most tedious part of things and the most uh, heart wrenching part of things for you was the post production process. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it is it is a world of tedium, um, to say the least. Uh, <laughs> I've I've edited music for people before, and there is a reason mm-hmm. I don't work in studios. Um, I just I could not sit and edit like that all day um Mm. it is it is a world of tedium uh to live in now uh what was that process like for you as as someone going through it for their first time with their creation with your baby what was it like um Mm. a to go through the process b to experience it with your creation and see your creation begin to take shape and come to life Mm. Yeah. Well, it was it was a really difficult process. I mean, the, the the reality is, you know, we had a fixed limited budget and we spent too much of it on production um, and we did not save enough for post-production. You know, uh, 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 the, the flip side of that is we got two great actors. We got um, Charles Baker, who who played Skinny Pete on Breaking Bad, and we got Krista yep. Allen, who um, had her sitcom Significant Mother. She was in Baywatch. So, you know, so we had two uh, great lead actors plus a number of other, um, you know, supporting actors uh, that, that I was absolutely thrilled that we had. Plus, you know, I, uh, in retrospect, perhaps it wasn't, all that wise to to write a, a low budget independent feature that is set one third on a on board a spaceship, um, <laughs> you know. 
I did uh, come to regret that decision. Um, I joined the post-production process. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was what it was. So the, the, because, because we had limited budget, uh, and I didn't even know this wrong, existed but we should have had a post-production supervisor somebody that understands the whole overview of post-production and managed the process and and coordinated all of the different um different crew that were doing the various different aspects of post-production sure we didn't have that person um by default i ended up doing it and i never should have done it a because i don't know how and b because I was trying to do a million other things as well, you know, keeping a business running, having enough, yeah. um, you know, money, to, money for the family, staying involved with the family, you know, all of those kind of things. And uh, so I, my capacity was very limited. I really only handle one person at a time. And, and, and it didn't have to be that way. We could have had uh, multiple people working alongside or, or in parallel with each other on different parts of the process but i couldn't i couldn't manage that and so i was you know so i was just dealing with one person at a time and that's one reason why things took so long sure um and one of one of the one of i think i think it's probably one of the most traumatic experiences of my life is i got up together a bunch of friends fairly early on it's i don't know maybe six months after we shot something like that and i showed them the rough cut of the movie with no effects other than me you know sticking in a photo of a ufo where there was supposed to be a ufo and you know uh and plan, plan nine version uh yeah so a very yeah right exactly um uh, even worse than that but um i want to see and that i showed and, and all the yeah. <laughs> no, you do not. Um, and all the green screen stuff was still just a green screen. Um, and and I showed it to people and asked their feedback. And the feedback I got was horrible. I mean, the, you know, basically everybody hated it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, at that point, I was at least two years into the process and we'd shot and, we, you know, oh. really wasn't a lot we could do about it. And uh it really, really did set me back uh, emotionally. Yeah, it took me a long time to recover from. That. Um, and I will, you know, I've learned I will not do that again next time. Uh, if I, if there is a next time for me, uh, I will not be showing something that rough to anyone. Uh, well, and you um, know that that goes to speak to something because um, I, I myself, uh, I frequently like don't even show my music to my wife until it's finished. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't really, there are a couple people that I trust, trust that can, um, that can hear what might go in the empty spots. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that, that right. can see that vision in the green screen. They can see the forest and the trees at the same time. And they can give me some honest feedback. Um, but it's it's hard to show somebody something a that you've spent such a conglomerate amount of time on and such a passion project to begin with, um, and then to have that response, yeah, it's it's hard um, because not everybody has the imagination to uh, to see what's not there, and I think that really goes straight back to um, the concept of improv. You know, um, it's something that my wife has to tell people in in her sketch troupe all the time uh, for for her show. The neighborhood is like, well, I don't have this. And she's like, but your character does like you don't have to physically have it. You see, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have the imagination to act like you have that in your hand? You know, because if you have it, then then you can put it forth right. and most people will accept the fact that, Oh, he's got that in his hand, yes. whether it's there or not. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, something that I, especially being a comic book fan, um, am big on is writing. Um, and whenever people are like, Oh, that movie was horrible. It's like, the, don't blame the actors, you know, like they, they can only mm -hmm. act what's on the page. 
so the fact that, yes, you had some great actors um, means that they were able to ply what was on the page and make it their own and and really go somewhere with it. So um, kudos to you on that. Like there's a reason why you won Best Comedy Feature, why you won Best Director and why you it, it, the Best Actor and Best Actress, you may as well have gotten best writing too um because it's only due to the writing that the actors can even pull anything off the page to work with you know there there are movies where uh tom cruise is amazingly awesome and there are movies where he just falls flat Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and it's it's utterly the writing of the movie and the way that things are plotted out and the way that characters are developed um, if there's if there's barely anything for an actor to work with for character development to begin with, then it's hard for them to tell a story and to emote a story to an audience. Um, so kudos mm-hmm. to you yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, where Thank you. now 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 comes the the next tooth pulling part of the process uh, distribution <laughs> distribution. Yeah. How do you go That's... about even tackling that? Yeah. Yeah. Another, yeah. Another gap in my knowledge. Yes. Um, so we, we are looking for the right sales agent and we are entering a bunch of festivals. Um, and it's a bit of a, you know, chicken and egg situation of, is it best to get a a sales agent who can help you get into the best film festivals or do you go into the film festivals, which will help you get a better sales agent? Um, sure. Yes, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know that there is a one correct answer, but uh, that's basically what we're we're working on is to is to get ourselves a sales agent and to um, learn as much as we can about the distribution process. I think to a certain extent these days, distribution ends up being partially self distribution. Um, oh, no sure. matter what you do, you've got to you, you've got to have your fan base you've got to promote it you've got to have people that want to watch it even if you are going to sell it to somebody else who's then going to sell it to the customers you've got to show them that that people want to see this movie That's right. um so you you have to do your own marketing as well so um so yeah. we're, we're learning all of that stuff so um yeah yeah it's so it a uh growing so, process isn't it Yes, it certainly is. Yes, I, I feel <laughs> I feel like I'm a different person than I was when I started this, and I, I also feel like I cannot believe. Are you still there? God, it pointed the process. I cannot believe. I... Oh, you lost me. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Good. Sorry. Yeah. So, um. I was saying I can't believe how ignorant I was at so many different stages of the production that, you know, the things now that are obvious to me in retrospect, I had no idea of beforehand. Um, and that has been the case all the way through. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's going to be the case in this next set, next element as well of the getting the distribution process. Uh, but I would say if anyone is interested to please do look us up on Facebook and Twitter, the 1111 movie should come up on both Facebook and Twitter um, and do like and subscribe, etc. Uh, we would love to have your support there. Uh, and also check out our trailer. We've got a great trailer. It's on YouTube. Um, oh, great. If you type in 1111 Eleven Eleven trailer on YouTube. It will come right up. Um, uh, take a look at that. Um, we, yeah, we'd love I, to have your support. I will make sure to embed that trailer in the episode post for this, so that it gets out to all of our listeners uh, right there with the player for this episode. Everybody, it will be directly underneath that. So uh, let's support these guys. Let's make sure um, they they get out there uh, and get the funding they need. That. Uh, they get the attention they need. Uh, I would highly recommend, Chris, that you check out the Breach.tv platform. Um, okay. they, are, they are like YouTube, but they monetize a whole lot faster. Mm. Um, and you get paid for views. It's, it's great. Um, that is where that is one of the main distribution points of all of the podcasts on the HC Universal Network. Um, and okay. it, is, it is a 
probably about a year and a half old platform with tens of thousands of users that are hungry for new content. So I guarantee you, if you put that up, man, you will start seeing some uh, some views rapidly. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, and if you can, it, once again, just tell everybody where they can go to check everything out for 1111, the film. And if you can hold the line after that, um, I will chat with you off air. Okay. So um, where one more time, where can they go on Facebook? Where can they go on Twitter? Where should they go to find 1111, the movie? Okay, uh, so uh, if you go to Facebook and just type in 1111 movie, we will come up. And uh, same is true on Twitter. Um, and uh, on YouTube, 1111 trailer will bring up, uh, will bring up the, um, the trailer. And yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, if you, if you can subscribe to us on any of those platforms, then you will find out our festival showings, which will tell you uh, when we're going to be in your area. Great. And where can anybody go to find out about translation services should they need them? Uh, our website for translation is abbn.com. That's uh, abridgebetweennations.com, abbn.com. Fantastic. Chris, once again, thank you so much for spending the time with myself and our audience. Uh, you shared some great information with us today uh, and a great personal story um, of growth, of business, um, and uh, being a self-starter. That's what this show is all about, is uh, showing people that there are numerous paths to life. There are numerous paths to following your passion um, in numerous different industries of production, whether it's film, whether it's audio, uh, whether it's whether it's running translation booths, they are they are all part of the of production of audio and video, um, either for film or live events. So, thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything with our audience. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun, and thank you for for doing what you do, and thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And uh, while you're checking his stuff out online, everybody, make sure to go to TalkingSoundShow.com. That is where you can find all of our episodes. That's also where you can find technical articles out the wazoo um, from major manufacturers like Rupert Neve, Sure Microphones. We also have instructional episodes there. There's also the Freelance AV Directory. If you are a freelancer like myself, there is a map of the United States. You click the region. It pulls up a list of states that, that have cities. You click the city, and there are companies that hire freelancers. So, Go check out the Freelance Index and make sure to check us out on our parent network, hcuniversalnetwork.com. Until next time, everybody, keep reaching for 11 and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. This is Talking Sound.